I've had the privilege of attending most of these last 11 years of Geodesign Summit and of hearing the wide range of application areas, seeing the technology evolve, seeing the community grow, which is wonderful. And the application areas that we've heard about for the last couple of days are, are wide and branching, but I want to talk about another one that's come to my attention and I don't think has been well enough represented in these talks. I'm a tourist. I understand tourism. Tourism is a deep human activity of uh, curiosity and learning and engagement and culture and science and a wide range of activities. I'm a, I'm a proud tourist. I've been to a number of places around the world. And I've learned a lot about the world in that process, as I think every tourist does. I've also been learning a lot more about tourism than I knew before I engaged on this. It's big. 10% of the world's income and employment, according to the chart on the right, and the world's third largest export category ahead of food. Nearly one-tenth of the world's carbon emissions. If you get a large crowd of people together somewhere, much fun can be had and much mess can be made. You have the possibility of infection of tourists by natives and natives by tourists and tourists by tourists all together, and you often have impacts on overstressed water system, waste systems, energy systems, public health systems, communication systems, and others. And as we know, from time to time, something comes out of the apparent blue to keep our designs resilient and test our resilience. I've been to all of these except for Machu Picchu, which is on my bucket list. And one of the things about tourism is that we want to go to places that are inherently often fragile and inherently designed not, in fact, to engage us. And that's part of what we like about it. And so there's a deep contradiction built in as a result of that. If there are any tourism planners and designers in the room and you're doing a great job, please don't take this personally. I've observed and the tourist experts that I'm working with assure me that indeed there's a lot of need out there. Indeed, I was approached by a uh, public health specialist who said, I'm working on this tourism project and we need to work with you. And I said, why is that? And she said, well, I saw your presentation at the Geodesign Summit and I know that we need geodesign. Often, tourism plans have a lot of words and some numbers and tables, occasionally some pictures, almost never any maps or systems thinking in any form. Rather, they're invocations for more, more, more. Increased visitation, higher sales, increased awareness, increased vision, more tourism products. And, you know, protecting natural resources and improving water quality are there in the parentheses as maybe part of a vision, but certainly not of an action plan. Tourism planning is a large, well-respected, well-populated uh, literature field of study. People get advanced degrees. Uh, if you search tourism and planning, as I did on Google, you get over a billion hits. But this tourism is intended for local residents and businesses, as well as the tourists. There's nothing about the place, the environment, that's inherent in much of this. Tourism planners are not landscape ecologists, and they're often um, not design thinkers in much of a way, and certainly not systems analysts. 
but they need to be systems analysts because it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out that there are transportation systems and public health systems and waste and water systems that are critical to the success of any of this kind of thing. So if you narrow your search for tourism plus systems thinking, you're down to 340,000 results, which is what, like one-third of one one-hundredth of one percent of the rest of them? But there is some there. It's understanding. There's, there's starting to be a, a, a professional literature about this with technical tools for bringing those aspects of systems thinking, which are seeing multiple scales at once, for example, and seeing interconnections that may be invisible, for example, into part of the thinking and planning process. Sustainable tourism particularly requires interconnected systems thinking, and I thank this morning's sessions for introducing the term regenerative. Regenerative is a beyond sustainable, and a lot of that um, comes from the work of uh, John T. Lyle at his Center for Regenerative Design at Cal Poly Pomona uh, more than a decade ago. And this idea that we can do better than just keep things alive, we can actually make things better, is a key part of actually geodesign. Who's heard this term in the news? It's in the news. You don't have to look very far anymore. Indeed, um, Edinburgh, Rome, Venice, Amsterdam, and Barcelona have all been called out by uh, CNN as hot spots for over-tourism. And we know if you listen to the news that in Barcelona there was practically rioting in the streets, not just about uh, the self-determination question, but about the despoliation of that city's landscape and urban infrastructure and culture as a result of this over-tourism thing. Growing costs of over-tourism, these scenes that look like something, either a soccer game or some kind of a natural disaster occurring across the board with all kinds of impacts of undesirable sorts are in the air. It's a hard and a big problem. Destinations have vowed to fight back. There is now an awareness of work ideas moving towards what can we do about this, other than just say tourists go home. Um, my colleague Megan Epler Wood uh, has worked together with Cornell uh, to produce a little video, which is the, also the representation of a book about the so-called invisible burden of tourism, those costs that happen when you um, privatize the benefits and re leave to the public the cost of cleaning up the mess and fixing the street and building the sewer and all of that. And so this is grossly out of balance now, but there is there's beginning to be uh, a movement and intelligence and, and intelligent people working on this. We've got to believe that good design can make good benefits, can do the right thing, and that indeed we will not all just be destined to being forced to stay at home and visit and do our tourism through our AR goggles and our cardboard boxes. We want to be able to go visit those places and we want to do it in a, in a, in a righteous way. The geo and geodesign is about the place and the people of the place are not just like those residents that we often hear about, but indeed all of the visitors who may be there at any moment in time. And so, Geodesign for sustainable tourism needs impact models to understand the impacts of the kinds of changes that are proposed. And there's a long list of the kind of things that we need to be actively working with the science and the policymakers in building for these kinds of purposes so that we don't see the kind of thing that we see there throughout the world. We've been teaching sustainable tourism, regional planning and geodesign at Harvard for a couple of years with my colleagues. Megan Eckler-Wood is the author of Sustainable Tourism, a book that's changing the world. If you Google them, Geodesign and Tourism, according to the last time I did a Google, our course comes up as the first four hits on this whole thing with the three of us and the course that we're working with as part of something called the International Sustainable Tourism Initiative. This is an online course, so it's not a massive MOOC by any means. We've had less than 30 people in each class. It's a semester-long, 15-week syllabus 
with lectures, workshops, and a global population, which has really been an important part of this. We use the Zoom uh, video conferencing technology to enable the course, which is a quite common technology so that we have people in all different time zones working with us. And through a series of lectures and case studies, we introduce a broad range of criteria. We identified for our purposes a wonderful case study site on the island of Sardinia with the help of Michele Campagna from Cagliari University uh, that has all of the things that you would want. We introduce a range of criteria, built and social, and we have a series of exercises that lead up to a geodesign workshop with the students working together on these criteria and a wide range of things. Often in a role-based way because we don't have the people of Oristano with us, but we have students who play the tourists and the fishermen and the conservation experts and so on. And that's been an extremely effective way and they generate these multi-criteria and multimedia final group and individual projects, all informed by geodesign. Thank you very much.